It's an amazing film, right? <laughs> Uh, when I first saw it in a commercial theater in the fall, I just, um, it just it, it left such a powerful impression on me. And as a lawyer, I think I've thought about a lot of a number of these issues. But to see the the human cost, not just to read about it, but to see in person, is is you know a, a completely different experience. So again, I'm Suzanne Goldberg, and I want to welcome you now to the discussion portion. Of the evenings of the evening, on behalf of Columbia's Office of University Life and School of the Arts, uh, with us or with us in a moment, uh, will be the co-writer and director of 99 Homes, Ramin Barani, a university professor and Nobel win Prize-winning economist Joseph Stiglitz, in conversation with financial journalist Stacy Tisdale, who will be our moderator. Uh, just a word about each. Um, they are coming. I know they're back there. Uh, so, uh, there we go. So, first, writer and director Ramin Barani's films have be, have premiered at Venice, Cannes, Sundance, and Toronto festivals, among others. He has won numerous awards and was called the Director of the Decade in 2010 by Roger Ebert. Professor Barani is also a Columbia College grad and now on the faculty of School of the Arts where he teaches film directing in the graduate film program. Joseph Stiglitz is Joseph Stiglitz. Um, <laughs> He is a university professor at Columbia, a Nobel laureate in economics, a former senior vice president and chief economist of the World Bank, and <clears throat> among many other things, as all of them are, uh, and um, also founded the Initiative for Policy Dialogue, which is a major think tank at Columbia. Financial journalist Stacy Tisdale has reported on business and financial issues for more than 20 years. She is currently senior editor at Black Enterprise. She has also done powerful educational work in her own right. Her financial literacy curriculum for high school students twice received the US Department of Education's Excellence in Economic Education Award. So here's the plan. Uh, Stacy will open up conversation uh, with our panelists, and then fairly soon after, we're going to open up, especially to the students in the audience, to um, come, <clears throat> come to the mics and ask your questions in groups of three. Stacy will explain. And all we would ask is that you uh, introduce yourself and say what school you're from when you uh, come up to speak. And again, I want to thank you all very much for being here. And Wonder, enormous thanks to the three of you for joining us for conversation. Stacy, Thank you. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. Well, first, many thanks to the Columbia Office of University Life for putting on this incredible performance and this evening. And as a financial journalist for more than 20 years, I can tell you that to see the story of the housing crisis and to think about the emotion of that time and to see it so humanized so that for the you know, people around the world who will see this film, it's not just about statistics. I really wanna thank you for doing that. But just a few statistics for you. From September 2008 to September 2012, there were approximately four million completed foreclosures in the United States. And I know that we like to think of this all as a problem of the past. But bank repossessions, which is actually the final stage of the foreclosure process, jumped 66% year over year in the third quarter of this year. So I recently read that Professor Barani hoped that 99 homes would take the large ideological ideas, be they class, economics, wealth, and equality, and put them into real human beings on the ground and spark a conversation about what's not working anymore, why it's not working, and how we might do better. Well, I'd like to thank you and congratulate you for doing both of those things so well. And you all have to just humor me for a minute because for me, Professor Stiglitz is a rock star. I have been a financial journalist forever, economist, and the way that he showed me, I'm just going to keep this, I have them to myself, me, that money can reflect back to us things about our behavior, both as individuals and as a society, our values and beliefs, and showing how fascinating that could be. 
then one of the numerous truths that he's pointed out about the housing crisis is that it really shows us that our beliefs about markets, particularly their inefficiency, don't work. So I look forward to a great discussion tonight. And again, I do reserve the right to interrupt anyone, interrupt anyone at any time to just kind of get <laughs> what I want to say. May I add something? Yeah. Because um, I will also have my own praise I want to give to Joe. <laughs> because I, I admired him so much and read his books and had wanted to meet him. Um, so one of the benefits of being a professor is you can arrange events to meet people. <laughs> and so I created an event called The Bigger Picture, which happens here in Miller, where I'll show a fictional movie and bring some genius that I want to talk to personally. And so I think three or four years ago, we okay. showed um, Oliver Stone's Wall Street yeah. as an excuse to meet you and talk about wealth inequality. <laughs> And I told you that night I was going to make a movie and I was going to name it in your honor as you coined the idea of the 99%. And so I named the movie in honor of, of Joe. <laughs> and so I also have my own admiration. <laughs> movie star officially trumps rock star. Okay. Would you like to say a few words? Well, uh, this is a very powerful uh, movie. Uh, the issues, uh, many of the issues that the movie deals with are issues that I've been uh, struggling with. Uh, but I always feel that, you know, you, you write a book like I wrote a book uh, about the financial crisis called Freefall. And I, I have to admit, uh, I find this much more moving than my book. And uh, it, it tells really, in a way, uh, a lot about what happened. Now, you know, what the movie can't quite do that my book do, does do, uh, I'll put a little plug in it, uh, is that there are big societal con consequences, big macroeconomic consequences. So economists, uh, you know, they, they deal with numbers about, you mentioned the number of foreclosures, uh, there are numbers, you know, what happened to our GDP, how it collapsed, uh, how we're still not really back to full employment. Uh, that you know, the, the, the if you include the disguised unemployment, it's still almost 10 percent. Uh, those numbers don't, I think, convey with as much force what how destructive what the bankers did as as the film does. And, and to me, you know, in terms of a social d a discourse about our society, it's very important to have these kinds of films that, that convey cold numbers into, uh, into p terms that everybody in our society can understand. Uh, let me just say one more thing, maybe. Well, uh, um, uh, in, in, in my book, I describe in some details sort of, uh, for those, you know, what actually, uh, the kinds of processes that were going on, um, the, uh, what you're seeing in this film is part of the securitization process. Uh, it sounds faster, when, but, you know, uh, they were originating mortgages and then selling them and packaging them, and then uh, when things didn't go out, go, go well, uh, they threw people out of their homes, and you know, it, it, that's basically uh, the, the story. And when the mortgages didn't do well, our financial system collapsed. You know, in, in short, that's the story. And those of you who've seen The Big Short, that's the other part of this whole securitization uh, uh, process. Uh, one of the things that this film brings out, even more than The Big Short, that there was a lot of fraud going on. Uh, that this was uh, a, that our whole economy from basically 2003 to 2007 was fueled on fraud. And it involved every major banker, every major bank, I should say. Uh, not every banker was engaged in the fraud, but every major bank. I remember uh, the head of one of the largest bank, probably the largest bank, coming up to me at one meeting and uh, asking me, uh, I, really quite amazed, he came up, to, came up to me and asked me, you tell me one thing that we're doing wrong. <laughs> and I almost said, you know, how long do you have? A couple hours, four or five hours? 
but the point is that we have only come to understand the depths of the fraud and bad behavior in the year subsequent to the crisis. We saw the symptoms here in the movie, film, but there are the, 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 the banks obviously didn't come forward and say, oh, by the way, uh, we're a racketeering organization that are involved in fraud. Uh, they hit it, and they did a very good job of hiding it. And a lot of this has only become uncovered as a result of really hard work by whistleblowers and suits against uh, the banks in which the fraudulent behavior uh, got discovered. Probably you and should tell fact, a little yeah. bit. I mean, first, the fraud on the ground was mind-blowing. And one of those whistleblowers is here. Lynn Simoniak, where are you, Lynn? You should clap for this woman, Lynn. Um, Lynn uh, was one of the people that really uncovered a lot of the fraud. Um, well, the banks made a huge mistake on trying to foreclose on her because she's a fraud attorney. <laughs> and, um, and she led a lawsuit to the tune of 90 million against the big banks and, and won, and was one of the key people helping me in researching the film down in, down in Florida. And we went to the courts together. Um, they're known as the Rocket Dockets. They decide your case in 60 seconds flat. Uh, I mean, really in 60 seconds. And I went there with my yellow legal pad. That's how I like to research. And um, you know, we saw people just losing left and right, including a Hispanic man who came with an interpreter. Um, the judge said, who is that? I'm the interpreter. Well, I don't have time for an interpreter if you don't speak English. That's too bad. And in 60 seconds, that guy was out. And this was stuff that Lynn was, had kind of waiting to show me that this was happening. And, and after about an hour of watching people lose, people started winning and kept winning and winning and winning. And I leaned over to Lynn. I said, Lynn, what, you know, what's going on? Why are people winning? And she, she was a known person by then. And she said, the judge sees you next to me with a yellow legal pad. And he thinks you're a journalist for the New York Times and he wants a good profile. <laughs> as long as you sit here, people will win. You know, and um, it, how, long, how long did you sit there? It was a very tough situation. We had another place to go, and we had to like just keep. We just kept staying, and and on the other side of the Florida was a, you know with the brokers I met, and and just the fraud in the film. That's just a tip of what was going on. It was so much more, and it was just the the macro stuff which I had read about in your books and in so much of the research I had done here. That was there, and, and I, but the stuff on the ground was so amazing to me. And part of the hope was what you had mentioned was if, if the movie impacted people, they would read your book, you would write an article about it, and you know, maybe someone would vote differently or, you know, I don't know, protest something, uh, whatever that does nowadays, who knows. But, <laughs> but the Occupy did turn up, which was kind of exciting for a while. But. Well, I don't know what to say with these guys. Um, let's, I'm sure we're just going to move the conversation into a Q&A with students so we can continue to share their wisdom. Here is the format. Okay. I am to ask students to line up behind, I see two microphones. So anyone who has questions, please line up. And then I'm going to take three questions at a time, summarize them, and let these gentlemen respond as they was like. I was hope you guys were going to be slow to line up so I could ask some questions. But <laughs> um, okay. And please, I ask all of you to make sure you tell us the, your name and the name of your school. Hi, I'm Kostas Kermidis. I'm from Greece. I'm an LLM student at the School of Law here. And uh, I want to say to, to say to all of you that I was very shocked uh, while watching the movie. But I would like to bring some experience that I have from back home. As you know, we're not in the best con con uh, financial condition now. And one of the reasons is that we do the exact opposite, opposite of what you saw at the movies. We have stopped for a couple of years now uh, any legal procedure. Again, people that don't pay. 
But all the statistics show that people that don't pay during the crisis in Greece were the same that didn't pay. And of course, there's always a, a statistical uh, mistake that we can do. But what we saw back home, it doesn't work. And I, 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 trust me, I came from, when I left for Colombia, the banks were closed. And when I came here, I, I understand that uh, we cannot keep up with what we saw in the movie. But I don't know, and I think that someone that would find an answer will have the honor to have the, the next Nobel Prize, how we can balance the, uh, applying the laws, enforcing the laws and the cost of equity and uh, the cost of uh, uh, financing new projects. And I think that nobody has found, uh, found that solution. Thank you so much. I, w I would really like to listen to your, your thoughts. So one of the things we'll be commenting on is how we handle these type of things, issues in the United States, something we were just discussing, versus others. But we're going to ask another question. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Noche. Oh, oh, excuse me. Noche. <coughs> yes. Hey, man. I, how you doing, man? <laughs> I just, in front of everybody, I'm going to thank you personally, because the reason I'm here was because uh, you, both because you made the film, but also because you played a role in, in telling people to support me when I was facing charges good. and I'm free. So thank you. That's a good and, revolutionary right there. You know, um, I came with a group of uh, young people, students in, in, in various universities and people from the neighborhood. And I have to say the film, um, it's almost like the Godfather in the sense of you see capitalism personified in that Rick Carver. You know, and you just like see what a what a system that has no sense of the humanity of people, and then what it turns people into. And um, I want to thank you for the film, and I you know I want to encourage everyone to check out the Revolution Club afterwards because we're bringing a tour onto this campus to talk about how we actually get free from this system that does this and much worse. I mean, like right now, what's happening in Flint reminded me of what I was seeing uh, happening to the homes of people. And you know, it's just nightmare after nightmare. And um, so I encourage everyone, again, come check out the Revolution Club because we can't keep on living like this. Yeah, no Noche was part of the, my panel um, yeah. for the screening of Do the Right Thing, yeah. um, which is, I'm so glad to see you. Yeah, man. You know, the, the whole thing about Shannon's character, Rick Carver, is that this, you know, of course, he, it's a deal with the devil movie. He is the, quote, devil in the film, the villain. But I hope it's clear to everyone the villain is the system that you're talking about and, and that it is the system that begot him. You know, Shannon didn't just materialize. You know, how many Iagos can there be in the world at one time? They come from somewhere, you know, and... And, and maybe I should comment that, that there were... Uh, other assist, very systematic aspects uh, uh, that weren't portrayed in the film, but were very much like uh, one of the things that when you threw people out of the homes, in many states, you didn't actually have to go to court. You would just have to sign an affidavit that you would examine the files and that this person owed money. Well, the banks found it inconvenient to have to examine the files. So they decided, well, nobody notices if I just sign an affidavit to the court and say that I examined the files. And then they said, well, I don't need, and so what, what, uh, this, this gave rise to what was called the robo-signing scandal. So they hired uh, a single person to spend all day doing nothing but signing affidavits that they had examined the records because it would be too expensive to hire uh, people who actually might work for a living. Linda so, Green. <laughs> so they actually, you know, just, and, the, and one of the reasons that the, 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 the fraud got uncovered was they would see the same name Linda oh, Green. Linda Green, over and over again. And how could Linda Green, you know, she's very productive, yeah. but how could she examine all those records? Yeah, that, a lot of that is what you're getting at in the, my, one of my favorite guys, Clancy Brown, the guy who plays Freeman in the film. That guy's office, that's a foreclosure mill where they're, they're um, backdating the notary's stamp. And 
that office is, and that whole character is based on a guy named David um, Stern, who was running a foreclosure mill out of Florida. He was doing about 40,000 a year. He was Fannie and Freddie's number one guy down in Florida. And it was really just a foreclosure, uh, a fraud mill. Um, he took his company public, um, <laughs> sold it for the Chinese, I think for 500 million, um, and got out of there and made a lot of money. And only later, I think Mother Jones broke the story on him, on what he was doing. And he never went to jail. It took a long time for him to get disbarred, but he never went to jail. He got all his money. Almost none of the people Correct. who committed this fraud went to jail. That's right. We have records of, you know, fraud does, just doesn't occur. You know, corporations don't just do fraud. There are particular people who do the fraud. And yet, almost nobody, nobody has gone to prison. But That's if we took an orange juice from the deli here and stole it, we would be in jail in no time at all. And if you did it three times in California, you'd be in prison for life. I don't want to say <laughs> what would happen if you were black. It's something That's much worse. That's what's one of the great things about the movie is that, it, I mean, you, you, you saw the Rick, you saw this is a person, that there's really someone doing this. Yeah. Hold everything. I we avoided the... No, I mean, not, no, 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 no. Three strikes and we were out. Show. You guys are not <laughs> off the hook. I'm going to bring this all together. What, what's your question? Hi, my name is Andrea Kwamia. I'm in the master's program of communication at the School of Professional Studies. And um, this film hit quite close to home because I was um, in high school when my house was foreclosed. So the motif that really spoke to me was that whole um, generational um, kind of how poor goes down the line and how sometimes pulling yourself up by your bootstraps is kind of a fallacy. So my question is, do you feel that the government has a responsibility to really inform or teach um, children from a young age about legalities and kind of about economic standards so that we can prevent some of these things in the future? So I want you two to both touch on the initial question that was brought up about you know, the system within the United States kind of comparing it to other systems and what happens to people financially when they get locked into this, as I've heard you call before, real estate addiction. And also to her question about if the government has a responsibility to better educate young people. And remember, you're talking to a financial literacy buff. Well, let me talk about the first question a little bit. The, the, one of the one of the issues that that came up in the discussion in the United States about what to do about the massive numbers of people who were having difficulty uh, paying their mortgages was that when proposals were put forward of uh, debt modification or uh, some forms of bankruptcy, uh, uh, something, uh, I propose something called a homeowner's chapter 11. The response from the bankers was uh, that would be unfair. It would be unfair to those homeowners who had paid their loans. Now, uh, the, 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 it should be, uh, pretty obvious that this was a pretty lame excuse because uh, you could have used the same arguments. There were some banks that didn't behave badly. 90% did, but if you use that kind of reasoning, it's unfair to bail out Bank America and JP Morgan and, and the other bad banks because there were other good banks that didn't behave badly, but they never mentioned that. <laughs> And they never mentioned the fact that actually banks like Citibank have been bailed out over and over again. They were bailed out in Mexico. They were bailed every, all those foreign bailouts with names of countries were really bailouts of American banks. So they were using this as an excuse. The real problem was the guys in the Obama administration, to some extent in the Bush administration, who were in charge were the same guys were that, that created the crisis in the first place. And so they listened to the bankers. And so their view was, uh, you know, originally, I, I remember uh, a phone call uh, I was on at the beginning of the crisis, and, and right after uh, uh, when Lehman Brothers went down and uh, the Bush administration uh, came forward with a $700 billion 
dollar proposal. And the Obama was a, a running for president, and he the question was what would be the position of the Democratic Party on that. And there was a discussion with a lot of uh, bankers uh, and a few other people. Um, and the Bush administration had proposed $700 billion. And most of the bankers' response was, why did you limit it to $700 billion? <laughs> uh, we might need more. And the answer was because a trillion sounded too big. And don't worry, if you need more, you'll get it. Uh, then I said, you know, uh, it's really important if you're going to bail out the banks to dig beneath the, where the problem was coming from, from the homeowners. And you ought to give money to the homeowners and figure out some way of helping them. The bankers quickly tried to shoo me off the phone call uh, and, and to say, you know, this guy, he doesn't, you know. In the end, out of the 700 billion, two billion about went to homeowners. And that gave you the sense of proportion and where... How, where, they, how much? <laughs> <laughs> of that, uh, so, I mean, but it gives you a sense that of, of the, even though that was the, the underpinnings of the whole crisis, you could not get the Obama administration, you could not get people like Geithner to focus on the homeowners. And one of the main reasons is they kept repeating this argument, oh, if you are soft on the homeowners, you're going to have what was called moral hazard, and everybody will renege on their mortgage. And the answer was nobody was proposing giving them a free ride. They were going to have to give up the equity in their homes, restructure their, the equity, and the, 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 get, uh, get, uh, restructure uh, uh, their claims. So they weren't getting a free ride. That was not being proposed by anybody. But the bankers did not want to recognize the losses, did not want to recognize that they had committed fraud, did not want to recognize that they had made bad loans. And so they, they tried to cover up the whole thing. And the catch-22 in all of that, as I remember when there was the big uh, settlement announced, it was actually reporting for Al Jazeera at the time, and what people could write down on their mortgages once there was a big settlement was taxed as income. That's right. And it took like another year to fix that. And that's right. That, that was, there were so many uh, mistakes that they have made in our financial stuff. That was, that was one. One of, the, uh, one of the other problems was they created these complicated systems of first and second mortgages. And so you couldn't get a restructuring of the debt until you get both the first and second. And the incentives of the second mortgage holder were such that he didn't want the debt restructuring. And, and so you got, you got a tug of war, and you sort of asked, didn't you think about this when you wrote this, when you created the system? And the answer was no. And this is from this brilliantly, uh, brilliant market economy that's supposed to have figured out and been very innovative. They created actually a juggernaut from which they couldn't get themselves out of. What, what is strange to me is, how, however many years later now, as we're looking at like the current political climate, and is that on one on one side, you know, Sanders is saying something and getting some attention, but the amount of attention Trump is getting is still so amazing to me. The 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 language in the film that Shannon uses about winners and losers, that this is a, which is now being used by Trump. But it's amazing to me that it, it works, actually. Uh, this I don't comprehend, really. How does, it come, becomes, how does it become socially acceptable to the people who are actually on the losing end of this deal? No, I, that I don't understand. But I think one of the things that is very interesting, that uh, what you're seeing in this election is uh, a lot of unhappiness about what happened in 2008. What and are we seeing with this election? Please, <laughs> let's just go there for I mean, a minute. I, I, I mean, tell you, honestly. just to this young lady who, I'm sorry to hear what happened to her in losing her home, but it's like, I don't, I don't know about law, I'm not an attorney, what they should teach kids, but I do think what's happening in a lot of playgrounds across the country is a flagpole gets erected, there is a flag at the top, 
that says winners, and from there all the way to the bottom, there is nothing but loser. This mentality is, I think, being generated from a very early age. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know how that changes. But can, can I go back to the other question that was asked as well, which was you can do about, you want, about, but... about finan education and, yeah. and the role of education. I mean, I think one of the things uh, that it, uh, was very clear about our financial system was that they were engaged in predatory behavior. You know, predatory lending is, was was at the uh, the most obvious form, but all of what they were doing was you know was a form of predatory behavior. And uh, there's an interesting book that's come out by uh, a good friend of mine. Uh, George Akerlof, uh, who got the Nobel Prize with me, and, and Rob Schiller, uh, called Fishing for Fools. And what he argues is that, a, that modern capitalism, a ma you know, one strand of capitalism and market economy that you're taught in your basic economics course is that markets are very efficient, people strive to make money by making more efficient products at lower cost. And there's one strand in which that's true. But what Akerlof and Schiller point out, there's another way to make money. And it turns out it's a lot easier to make money by looking around for people to prey upon and take advantage of. And what they document in this book is, uh, the, you know, in, in many, many areas, there's this kind of fishing for fool. And it uses the pH from, from the... Uh, uh, fishing in, in a computer, looking for, 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 uh, for fools, that it turns out it's much easier to make money by fishing for fools than coming up with better products. Now, obviously, if we had better education, you immunize, you make it more difficult to fish for, for fools. But one of the stories in the United States is that we've underinvested in education, and because of that, there are more fools. The other aspect of it is that uh, finance, finance has gotten more and more complicated, so that it, it is more difficult for an ordinary people to understand, and, and that makes it easier to fish for fools. One of the real points that Elizabeth Warren has been emphasizing, we ought to have contracts that people could read, yes. that if any of you have succeeded reading your uh, credit card statement, uh, you ought to get a law degree automatically. Uh, <laughs> that uh, it's not meant to be read by anybody without a law degree. And, you know, amazing to me that financial education is only required in, I think, 15 or 16 states. So uh, three question format, or we have three people in this line. We have about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to ask you to each um, briefly and succinctly say your questions, and then they will just have at it. And then I see there's a fourth person back there. I'm going to try to get all of them in, so go ahead. Um, hi. Uh, my name is Carolina Simon. I'm an executive MBA. I hope I'm not the only MBA student here in this <laughs> room. Uh, but thank you. Thank you for the movie, and I've taken your class, Professor Stiglitz. Uh, my question is about the future in the sense that I, I happen to evaluate the real estate market, so I look at uh, a lot of stats every day. And what I see um, in terms of the fundamentals and in terms of um, all of the indexes is that people are, especially the millennials, I'm, I'm Generation X, so I don't represent anything uh, for the future in terms of real estate investments. <laughs> uh, and. But what's happening and what I see is that affordability and the ability to own a home um, is dramatically decreasing, um, as even as the economy improves, as well as uh, credit uh, availability uh, eases a little bit, which is not uh, always a good thing, as, as, as your movie shows very well. So my question is, how will people be able to, the, the millennials, be able to afford to um, generate um, their, their returns over time by owning a, a home. So I wonder what thoughts you have. Thank you. Okay, so how will millennials be able to afford to exist? Go ahead. 
Hi, light I'm, topics for you guys to handle. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Connor, and I'm a first year at Columbia College. Um, my question is, it's also about the future. Um, so how do you think that going forward, um, that like American style capitalism can be saved from its excesses if it can be? Um, and how realistic is that? Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Avi. This question is specifically for Raman. Um, one thing, I really love the movie. Thank you so much again. One thing that stuck out to me was really the sort of racial composition of the movie. Um, and I'm interested in hearing from you um, sort of what was your thinking behind presenting the range of racial identities with the roles uh, that they held in the movie. Uh, what was your thinking behind that? Thank you. So how will millennials and home ownership well, we have to make a real radical readjustment to capitalism and racial racism and predatory lending and how that played out in your script. Again, light subject matter for you both to tackle, right? We now. talked about some of it at dinner. I mean, we're at a 40 year low in home ownership, but Joe, you're probably best suited to answer some of those. Are we, is, you want to take the last question at the same time? Sure. Hi, my name is Juana. I'm also with the Revolution Club uh, with Dacia, and um, they actually paved the road for my question because it has a lot to do with the future. And um, I just think that, you know, it is very important to uh, kind of sort out what the problem is. And then it seems like we're here all agreeing that the problem is this capitalist system that it actually turns people into what we saw in the movie. It pushes people to act in certain ways. Ideas and, and the feelings and the wishes and the desires of people are all shaped by this mode of production. You know, this economic system, it's capitalism. And I don't know the, all the in and out of, um, you know, the market and uh, the business of the housing and all that, but I do, you know, want to talk about this new work by, by Bob Evakian uh, that is called The Strategy, The Leadership. Uh, actually, I'm going to read. I'm going to be brief, don't worry. You should cut her off. Tell her to go. Miss, yes, I while you're, we can discuss this, and there's also going to be a play. Um, okay, I'm give so you information. my question, yeah. So my question is, given the capitalist system being the problem, right? Like, how do we see, how do we see, like, a solution? Because yep. it is- Okay, it, we, get, we get your question. Um, I just, we I just want, want, like, 30 seconds, man, be, month, more, because there is this, there is this, uh, you know, like, hopes that we can do something out through the, the system that, you know, electing politicians, but then we saw that th this is much bigger than us. So I do want to point out that not, there are not solutions under this system, and that we actually need to change the mode of production. Yeah. And then okay. I'm okay. talking about a revolution, and Miss, people you, should be, I'm you know, exposed you to this kind of thing. Thank you. Okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you. And if you let let me begin by, by talking about the first question, which is uh, how are people going to uh, be able to afford a home? Let me, let me say one of the problems actually goes back to the attempt to get out of the macroeconomic problem that was created by the crisis itself. So the, ma the, 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 the bad mortgages led our economy to go into free fall and uh, we were tied up basically in a political gridlock. What we needed was a fiscal stimulus. We couldn't do it. The only instrument we had was monetary policy. We brought interest rates down to zero, not only short-term interest rates, but long-term interest rate. The reason that's relevant here is that those low interest rates help raise asset prices and make houses more afford less affordable, particularly in New York. <laughs> uh, the other reason that New York prices are very high have to do with the fact that all the corrupt money from all over the world is finding a nice home here in New York City and, and our major uh, uh, other cities. So, so part of the problem is we obviously have an inflated real estate market, and part of the reason for 
again, another part of the reason for that is a tax system that doesn't tax long-term capital gains at the rate that people who work for a living. So all of those are distortions in our system that have led to very high real estate prices that make it more difficult for ordinary people to afford. In terms of running a mortgage system that will make housing more affordable for young people, uh, for, for most people, uh, I, I think uh, the system that we were using uh, before the crisis 2008 that was so exemplified in that movie, uh, that is a system that I predicted well before the crisis would not work. Uh, there are inherent problems. And so to me, it was not a surprise that you wound up with this pro these problems of, uh, of fraud, bad mortgages, and so forth. It was really predictable, and it was predicted that that these problems would arise. Right now, the mortgage market really isn't working. 90%, over 90% of ordinary mortgages are being, a re are being underwritten by the federal government. And this is in a country where you have people talking about we're, being, we're basically a, a private market economy. All the mortgages today, uh, essentially all the mortgages, are underwritten by the federal government. We have a broken system. So what I th have been arguing is we ought to recognize that the system doesn't work and that the main pieces of information that are required for a good mortgage are the value of the home and individual's income. And those are information that the government ought to have because every mortgage, every, every land, every real estate transaction is registered and the income taxes are your evidence of what your income was. So the, I've been arguing for a, what you might call a public option for mortgages, which would provide mortgages at like 1% over the T-bill rate. And that would make housing, once again, more affordable. I think it would be, eliminate the kind of predatory behavior that we've seen. Why don't you go with the next question? If uh, I can the, ask you. The racial makeup, was that? The one about, how did you, yeah, the racial composition. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the question The question, meant, I think the. I um, think. Um, how did you think about the, it? The, one of the big decisions was for, for, at least for Dennis Nash and his family, like one of the big decisions for me on that was my feeling, especially based on earlier films I've made, like um, Man Push Card and Chomp Shop and Goodbye Solo, where way back, by, by the way, in, in like 2006 or seven, when I was screening Chomp Shop about poor Latino kids in Queens, usually to an audience of intellectual white people, um, they would be like, they kept thinking about that as some other world, and I kept trying to tell them, no, this is happening right now to everybody, but it didn't click until one year later when the crash happened. And so one of the decisions with Nash was, the, the character here, was I wanted him and his family to be middle, middle class white so that people would understand this is happening to everyday, what they think of as everyday people. Um, in terms of all the people that he knocks on their doors, which might be what the question was getting towards, all the people that, that, that Andrew Garfield character knocking on their doors, those are purposefully mixed in terms of age, gender, and race, and are comprised of actors and real people. So a lot of those people are real people in their real homes, um, and some of them are actors. And then I just wouldn't tell Andrew who was who I wouldn't tell him if it was an actor or a real person, nor would I tell him what was going to happen when he knocked on the door. Um, so like the elderly man, uh, which is like a really horrible one to watch, which all those, all those evictions are based on real evictions that I've witnessed or that a broker has told me or that Lynn told me about. The old man is an ev eviction that I sadly witnessed, which was a ho horrible thing. That guy actually had dementia. So I told Andrew that that guy wasn't living in his home and had dementia, so I didn't know what was gonna happen and he would just have to deal with it, whatever it was. Um, that's kind of how those people got picked and, and chosen and then the, the, speaking of real people, by the way, the sheriff is a real person. He's a real sheriff who actually does evictions and that led to a real force and intensity in those scenes, especially when 
Laura and Andrew getting evicted. That's a real guy. He just, you can't mess around. You could talk all you want, but he is going to do it. And the people throwing the stuff out to the curb, one is an actor, but the rest are actual clean out crew people who do that for a living. Again, so they're adding an authenticity and an intensity to those, to those scenes. As um, I so unfortunately have to wrap this up now, but. Oh, for, um, by the way, for a split second, Shannon's character was almost played by another actor, quite a famous um, black actor, and then in the last second he didn't do it. If that had happened, then a lot of stuff about, um, specifically about banks targeting um, blacks, that would have then become part of that's what I was the story. Going to totally there, there's touch a very nice. Throw, yeah, don't throw away what bad word throw away, but what you've done is. Um, totally to your point that you wanted people to see that it could have been anybody. As a person of color, I was thinking racial, like the first thought is, you know, predatory lending really attacked the black community. Why isn't this a family of color? It would have taken the movie in a completely different yeah. direction. And I heard a reporter on CNN last night make the, a comment that I try to really ring the bell on a lot. African Americans earning $75,000 a year are the fastest growing income group in the country. Why is it that every one of these political candidates, even you know the Democratic candidates, every time they talk about a gap or a predatory lending story, it's the black person. So I think that um, intentionally or unintentionally, it made a very big statement, and I think that um, it's also something for us to discuss further, and I'm going to tell you how we can continue the conversation, is that um, a person of color starring in this movie would have made it a different movie and a different conversation that I think we need to move, well, that this helps us move beyond, so I thank you for my, all of it. My first three films, they were all Pakistani, Latino, and black were the leads of the first three films, and it, the people watching them typically were white, and they didn't seem to get it, that these economic pressures, these, this system was about them too. And I started to get, I was like, whoa, whoa, you guys gotta wake up a little bit here. You know? I get it, I totally got it. So many thanks to Columbia's Office of University Life for hosting this event. It's so interesting, we're not ending on the typical, yet there's hope <laughs> that always ends these talks. I kind of like the, the woman wants to have a revolution. Let her have it. You all can continue the conversation on the University Life website at universitylife.columbia.edu. I went up there, click the Ideas and Actions tab at the top of the page and leave your comments. You can also, you don't want to miss this because you can have a chance to win a DVD of 99 Homes. Comment via email at universitylife.columbia.edu. People who submit their thoughts and reflections have a chance to win. Hold on a second. That's my actor from my third film, Suleiman C. Savane. DVD. Goodbye, Ooh, Solo. over there. This guy's a great actor. Goodbye, Thank Solo. Thank you for coming. Oh, my God. Follow Columbia U Life on Twitter and Instagram and Columbia University Life on Facebook. And this has just been an honor, and thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Sorry.